very a very good evening to everyone so before the start of the event uh, let's all rise for the national anthem Janagana mana adinayaka jayahe Bharata barka vidara Panjapa sinta kujarata maratha Travila utkala ganga Vivindya himachala yamuna ganga Utkala dhala sita ganga Dhamba shubha name jahe तब शुभ आशीष माहे जाए तब सयतारा जनगण मंगल नायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विदादा जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे It's an apt start to an evening, and before the start of the evening, we all Madras means so many things to so many of us, and it means different things to different uh, places, different people. But ipo didir na naawande Tamil la pesna apdi irka. Elaru ko vanakam vanga iniya malai ungla varve irka da apdi na oru connect varthilla. In the connect enna apdi na enna enna ko in the city ko oru samandho irka. அதில் எனக்கும் ஒரு பங்கு இருக்குங்கிறது எல்லாருக்கும் புரிய புரிய வைக்கிறது அதுக்கு ஒரு பெரிய பங்கு வகிச்ச ஒரு விஷயம்தான் மெட்ராஸ் லோக்கல் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி குரூப் ஸோ இட்ஸ் அ ஹானர் டு கிவ் அன் எக்ஸ்ப்ளனேஷன் அவர் இன்ட்ரடக்ஷன் அபவுட் தி மெட்ராஸ் லோக்கல் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி குரூப் ஸோ ஷிஃப்ட் ஐ பேக் டு இங்கிலீஷ் ஸோ மெட்ராஸ் லோக்கல் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி குரூப் வாஸ் ஸ்டார்டட் இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் ஃபிஃப்டீன் பை வெங்கடேஷ் சார் அண்ட் த நீட் ஆஃப் த குரூப் வாஸ் டூ திங்ஸ் one is there are lot of information available but whether it is accessible there are so many many uh, information available but whether it is accessible is what makes it more relevant and i think it opened the minds and hearts of lot of people to go back to history and like uh, uh, venkatesh sir generally mentions history doesn't uh, um uh, give job or give money but it history gives a sense of happiness to everybody we all like to hear stories and mlh was a reason uh, to have so many of these stories put together and first point i spoke about accessibility and availability second point was crowdsourcing crowdsourcing finances is altogether different but crowdsourcing information is a little bit difficult because sometimes we want to keep the information to ourselves so it opened out arenas for different people to share information so at one point uh, if if someone asks about a particular location there will be 50 to 60 comments which talks about people who have actually visited the place in different timelines there would be around hundreds of images in one thread which talks about okay this place was like this this has changed like this and there would be a very different connect to that place and we st- and finally collating all that information together we have another story about a locality which we had no idea about and i think that start of mlh gave local history or i would precisely call it social history or common man's history or common man's thoughts played a major role and major change in people looking at madras in a different light so uh f- from last year mlh has been having a series of lectures for the madras day so this is the second year which we are having uh, lectures so it's a uh, series of 6 days and today we have two wonderful speakers speaking on the same topics in which uh, mlh has been uh, pioneers in and then first point is accessibility right taking different art forms and different people and literature to different levels different places so our first uh, speaker uh, talk, uh, talks about taking it to a different land and taking the essence of it and spreading it all over and then the second speaker of today we have a person talking about 
our temples and our places which we didn't have a uh, mind to go back and look at in a different light so i won't take much time and uh, first i would like to uh, thank uh, uh, thank thank two of our sponsors for today usam technologies and patrikai.com uh, can we have a round of applause for them because without for them will not be here for today so thanks to them and i think supporting heritage and history like uh, all of us know needs a kind of uh, um a mindset to do that so thanks to our sponsors for today and i would like to uh, call uh, rk sir to honor our guest of today uh, Sund uh, cleveland sundaram sir please a round of applause please Generally, I'm not a paper and read person, so it was difficult for me to go back and read. But sometimes, when you read few profiles, you feel, oh, they have varied interests. And sometimes, when you read profiles of people, you feel, oh, they've made a huge change. And I felt both of that uh, today. So it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Uh, V. V. Sundaram started his professional life in 1964 as the finance and administration trainee in the electronic data processing department of Union Carbide, Kolkata. He retired as the managing director and CEO in a U.S.-based technology company. Academically, he has a master's degree in computer science from the University of Pittsburgh. and a second master's degree in business administration from Case Western Reserve University Cleveland additionally he has undergone advanced management training at duke university colorado school of mines and weatherhead school of management he is one of the volunteers who helps run the cleveland tyagaraja festival which celebrated its 42nd year in the spring of 2019 so he is mentioned as a volunteer i would say he's been a kingpin of the festival so like uh, he has been one of the reason which it sustained for a long time and 42 years is not a simple task he is the secretary of the aradhana committee as well as the bairavi finance two organization that since 1970 are dedicated to propagating indian classical arts in north america he has also been one of the trustees of the shiva vishnu temple of greater cleveland and is currently associated with the sri venkateshwara temple of cleveland in the early 70s he was the part of a small team that initiated and built the built the sri venkateshwara temple in pittsburgh he divides his time between india and us and we are lucky to have you today sir thank you so over to our speaker for today thank you <coughs> thank you very much it is a very daunting talk today speech because If you want me to speak for about eight ten minutes, you can hit a couple of points, and then before you know, the speech will be over. But when you got about forty five minutes to an hour or so, and you have to make sense, which is the most important thing, that becomes uh, very difficult. The topic that was given to me was um, the Sabha culture, how it has moved from uh, Chennai to United States, North America. I changed the. title to something else i said the the title i gave it is um, agriculture of arts how classical arts have been transplanted in north america and there's a reason for this particular one this couple of reasons one is that it was very appealing number two it was given to me by my son and i dare not cross my family members you should know that first so he said apa this makes sense talk about it and i thought about it and it really made sense because about 200,000 years ago if you look at the first ape or a group of chimpanzees that decided to get down from let us say a, a tree in um, in the savannas of east africa and decided to walk on two feet rather than crawl on four feet the homo sapiens uh, came into existence right after that and they were mostly nomadic people they were kind of 
travel from East Africa, from the savannah towards the steppes of Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia, modern day Saudi Arabia. From there, they branched out in the Indo Gangetic Plain and so on and so forth, populated the whole earth. And they were hunter gatherers, and they, somewhere along the line, they decided to become farm a city, lay the roots, and um, start farming. Because hunters and gatherers' life is always nomadic. If you want to settle down in a particular place, agriculture is the best way to do that one. So farming began about 15,000 years ago, according to historians and anthropologists. So I was thinking about it. Is there a parallel between that and what's happening in North America? Well, until about 1950, I would say until about 1960, there were very few Indians who were allowed to migrate to North America. Essentially, they were like the hunters and gatherers. Uh, they will come on what is called the uh, exchange visitor visa, J-1 visa it used to be called, come and work for about a couple of years or so, and then scoot back to India. There is no pa path towards a permanent residency leading on to a citizenship or anything. And somewhere in the 1960s, President Lyndon Johnson came and said that we want to have the best talented people from all over the world. We do not want to essentially restrict to the Europeans who are dominating at that time the North American continent. We are going to give 20,000 visas to every country in the world and we will go through and pick up the best and the brightest. And before you know, quite a few people started coming into, from India, into North America. And like the homo sapiens who decided to settle down and form their roots, and uh, instead of becoming a hunter and a gatherer to become a farmer, these Indians also decided to settle down, form their roots, and um, become part of the society. That's how it started. It started in the 1960s that way. And from then onwards, from the early 60s onwards, Quite a few Indians were given the opportunity to migrate to North America. They will come either as immigrants or they will come as students and then convert themselves into an immigrant visa and then later on became um, the citizens of the U.S. In that sense, the, the spread of the Indian population kind of also necessitated certain one other thing. The earlier times, the Homo sapiens, when they spread from the East African savanna, they wanted to take familiar food with them. That's how wheat and rice and other cultivation took place. And in a similar sense, and as an analogy if you look into that one, the Indians who moved into North America also decided that as much as we know what kind of food we can get and other thing, the food for the soul which is a classical art, is the one that they wanted to take it with them and start transplanting that in this alien soil. So where do we stand now? After 50, 55 years or so, I want to give you a sense about where this art is, where this Cleveland Tyagaraja festival is there. So the festival took place this year in a stadium. We had 4,820 people attend. You could see the crowd. And on the stage during the Pancharatanam singing, we had more than 350 people. Out of that, 150 people flew in from India specifically for this festival, 150 people. 
So this is the size. How do I know it is 4,820 people? The stadium has got a, a camera that counts the number of people. They also have a foot counter. As you enter into the stadium, it counts. As you go out also, it counts. And within these three devices, they can precisely pinpoint how many people are there. So it's 4,820. Now, we used to say a statement saying that Cleveland Tyagaraja Festival is the largest festival outside India. And it's no longer true. I have to tell you that. It is the largest festival now, period. Because nowhere in India, for a classical music, you will get 4,820 people. They are not from Cleveland. They come from all over the United States. In fact, 20% of our people who attend the festival are from California, which is 3,000 miles away or 5,000 kilometers away. We get regularly people from Australia, both from Melbourne as well as from uh, Sydney. From Toronto, for example, we'll get about 15 to 20% of our audience. Chicago, New York will contribute another 10 to 15%, Houston and so forth. It's a national festival that happens to be held in Cleveland, Ohio. It's not a Cleveland festival that attracts the national audience. Well, I don't know, however you want to define it, okay? So this has become the largest festival today. How did it happen? How was the growth? Was it something that we looked into Chennai, saw the, the, the Sabha culture over here, and did we transplant it over there? Or is it something different, something organically that grew very naturally to that particular area? So in the 1960, I said the Indians started coming in first. Okay. How was life at that time? I want to give you a glimpse of that. Those of you who are used to cell phone today, those of you who are used to WhatsApp, those of you who are used to an in instant calling of your people anywhere in the world and getting to know what they are doing, you should know that there was no direct dialing possible between India and United States at that time. In 1969, when I first went as a student, you take a flight from Chennai. It's like a local town bus. The flight will go and stop in Bombay. From Bombay, it will go to Karachi, drop some passengers, pick up some more passengers. From Karachi, you go to Yadan, stop there for about three hours or so. From there, picks up passengers, drops, goes to Rome, stops there. And then from there, it goes to London or Frankfurt. And then it takes a deep breath, the plane, because it has to cross the Atlantic now. So far, it has crossed only about 500 miles or 600 miles. Now it has to cross 3,000 miles. So it flies across the Atlantic, goes to New York and drops you there. Then you take a flight from there to wherever you want to go, Cleveland, Chicago. I was going to Pittsburgh. So you take a flight over there. And then after you go there, this takes about three days, those days. And you come there, and then you have to hunt for your post office to buy what is called an inland letter. I don't think any, most of you will know what it is to go to your post office to buy a letter and mail it, given that today you all use either WhatsApp or an or an uh, email kind of your thing. So you go to your post office, buy an inland letter, write your mom and dad saying that you safely arrived and mail it. And then it takes three weeks for the mail to reach them. So for one month, you are in a black hole. Nobody knew what has happened to you. Mom and dad essentially put you on your plane. Okay, My dad used to go and uh, he used to do the Parayanam in uh, Sundara Gandam every day. I'm sure that he prayed for me. My mother went every day to the local Subramani Swami Koval and hoped that son reached the shore safely and other things. That's the life. There's no different from 1969 onwards, I would say until almost 74 or 75 or 76. And imagine somebody coming even earlier than that, 1960. If you could not afford an airplane ticket, then you take a ship. And the ship will take 60 days to come to the United States. For three months, you have no idea where your children have gone. Okay? And you're a rich man. If the government allows you to take money with you, you know how much money you were allowed to take? $50 is what is allowed to be taken with you at that time. And then at the airport, if you go there and talk to the bank counter there and weasel your way, you will get another $8, precisely $8. So you board the plane with $58 in your pocket to a new country and you have to live until whatever is the next paycheck you are going to come. Where is art? How is it going to flourish art under these circumstances? Think about it. Today, you want to reach out 
to a musician, you post it on Facebook. You look for him in Facebook, okay? And that's instantly you get a reply. There, you need to get somebody's address. You have to write a letter to that person. It takes three months. He doesn't know who you are. He doesn't know. If you say New York, he probably would know it. But if you say Cleveland, Ohio, he had no idea. If you say even Chicago may not be known. So you may not get a reply. You may get a reply. And then the whole process takes something like about three or four months of time before they agree to come and perform. These, these are the logistics. Okay? And you are an Indian. And you want to have an Indian food, for example. I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The nearest grocery store was in New York City, which was 500 miles away. The Indian grocery store today in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, in Chicago, every street corner has got an Indian restaurant. Every other store is an Indian grocery store. You have no idea what it was. Life was like at that time. Then how do you make, what, do you, what, what brings art under those circumstances to a, a country like North America? It takes, it takes the perseverance, the will, and the passion of a few people. Towering among all the people who have done everything for art is one personality about whom you have never heard, I bet. His name is Dr. V.K. Viswanathan. Dr. V.K. Viswanathan is a scientist, retired as a scientist now. He worked in, uh, in uh, the National Laboratories in New York. Then he went to Los Alamos and worked with the, the weapons division over there. That's where the first uh, atomic bomb was fabricated. He was a student of Alladi Ramakrishna over here in Chennai, studied in Madras Christian College and then to Presidency College and then came to United States in the 60s. Late 50s, I would say, in the early 60s. And uh, Manian, one of the writers at that time, had a series called Idayam Pesikiradu. And there he talked about V.K. Vishwanathan. Okay. And V.K. Vishwanathan had this abiding passion for two things. Science and technology is one thing. Music and dance is the other thing. You cannot take these two out of him. He had the opportunity to work with somebody like Richard Feynman, Nobel laureate. He worked with Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. Okay. And today, he'll, he comes to Chennai, we go to the Ritchie Street, casually he will ask, do you have such and such a, this one, resistor or something like that, or a IC? And one guy made the mistake of telling him, sir, do you know for what purpose you need it? He looked at him and said, I know, because I patented that. <laughs> He's that kind of a guy, okay? Where he, he comes with your dhoti, with your shirt, okay, white shirt, and he'll be having this um, small bag in his hand, and he'll be walking around, the most unassuming guy. And then, and then you find out that he designed the, the rover on the moon landing for the moon landing, okay? And when the Iraq war happened, I used to kind of tease him saying that, all the bombs that are bombing with this one falling over there, the laser guidance was done by him, okay? You are personally responsible for all the death, I used to tell him that, okay? And he's that kind of a scientist. And we gave Sunadan on the other side, he's also passionately interested in music. How passionately interested he was, he narrated one story to me. There was one Srivanji a Mani Iyer, who was a, almost a clone of Madurai Mani Iyer, sing exactly like him. He was in Mayavaram. And uh, V.K. Viswanathan and his friend um, N.V. Subramaniam, I don't know whether you know him or not, he retired as the general manager of uh, Southern Railways and runs uh, Saraswati Vage Kara Trust, a sabhav over here. N.V.S., they are all classmates. They decided to get Sri Vanji a money a year for a program. And uh, they couldn't afford to pay a third-class ticket, unreserved ticket, from Mayavaram to Chennai and back, which cost 5 plus 5, 10 rupees in those days. And he, he would, you would have to pay him at least 10 rupees for your three-hour concert, right? 20 rupees. And then an auditorium will cost you, maybe in a temple they will take 2 or 3 rupees. And then each pakwadim has to be paid about 3 or 4 rupees. The total budget was 50 to 60 rupees, and they didn't have the money. They were students, okay? But that didn't stop them. Okay, if I can't get Sri Vanjiya money a year, they said that we will go one step further and get Madhuri money a year or Mali to come and give you a concert because they are in Chennai and they had this sweet tongue. 
they can go and convince anybody why it is in their own interest to come and give a performance for absolutely no money at all. And Mali would oblige. Madhuri Maniyar would oblige. And they will have their concert. So this Madhuri, this VK Vishwanathan comes to United States pursuing his um, postdoctoral research in optics, lasers, and uh, weaponizing the space, going to the moon and other things. And then in the heart of heart, he says that I got to do something about music. But there's no money. Okay. He was a student. It never stopped him. It never stopped him. Pandit Ravi Shankar once came to him and said that, <clears throat> I want to perform in New York. And VKB said that, all I can do is that I can bring you to my living room and uh, you can give you a concert. And the best I can do is that, I'll tell you what, I will get the, the senior most professor of music at the university to come and attend your concert. That's the only thing I can do. I can't pay you. Ravi Shankar is supposed to have said, can you get me a good bottle of wine? That is good enough. I'll come and perform for you. And he performed okay, in his house. And the professor who came and listened to him was so enchanted, so taken in by Ravi Shankar's music, he called him to come and perform at the conservatory and paid him at that time the princely sum, a king's ransom of 25,000 American dollars. Do you know how much it is equivalent to today? Close to half a million dollars in today's terms. Okay? And Ravi Shankar never forgot that. That good thing that B.K. Viswanathan did to him. They remained close friends until the very end, actually. And, and here he was. B.K. Viswanathan, we call him B.K.B. He's in New York. Totally starved of music. And then a few things happened at that time. This is in the early 60s, late 50s, you can say. John Higgins, who is called Higgins Bhagavatam, came to Chennai, decided to learn South Indian music, Carnatic music, learned from T. Viswa and uh, the Brinda School, and uh, came back to the United States, joined Wesleyan University, wanted to have a world music at that time. Simultaneously, there was a guy by name Bob Brown, who came to learn Mridangam and uh, published his, his PhD thesis was on Mridangam at uh, Columbia University, I think, if I remember correctly. He was in Princeton. And then a bunch of other people, okay. Bill Skelton, for example, of University of Rochester, was interested in Nadaswaram. He came in the 60s and 70s, learned Nadaswaram from Mambalam Siva and started teaching it over there. And then he got interested in Bharatanatyam. He worked with Kamala, the legendary dancer, and Sudharani Raghupati over here, right now in Chennai. And worked with them and brought uh, Bharatanatyam to Rochester, University of Rochester. You had quite a few other North, the Asia Society, for example, decided to bring in people from India for a concert tour. And there was VKV in the midst of all these things happening. And he said that, went to Wesleyan University, where John Higgins was there, and said that, why don't we start an ethnomusicology division over here? And then brought in people like Kalyanakrishna Bhagavatam, brought in Ramnath Krishnan, brought in K.V. Narayana Swami, okay, and Palkat Raghu, V. V. Subramaniam, Yes Ramanathan, and you talk about the stars of that particular time. They were all willing to come because V. K. Viswanathan had two things going for him. Passion for music and dance, number one. Was he passionate? Number two, he also could convince anybody to do whatever he wants them to do. So he will talk to these people and say, come to the United States, I'll take care of you. All through letters, the other thing. And it was not easy. As I said that, today, if I want to have a program, I, I bring an artist from India, I want to have a program in North America, all I have to do is I put it on the social media. So-and-so is coming at such and such a time, this is his bio data, etc., etc., and you get about 15, 20 responses saying that we would be interested in hosting this one. Those days, you don't even know who is there in which city. Are they interested in music? So one of the things he decided was that we will, he founded the Bharati Society in New York City. He was the founder. Then he went town to town, city to city, founding Bharati Society in every one of the city. Cleveland has got a Bharati Society. Toronto has got a Bharati Society. Detroit has got it. Chicago has got it. In all these places. Imagine a single man making a difference, both in terms of culture, heritage, art and everything. Okay. 
And this is how it started. Then, you know, one of the thing, next thing he decided was that I started kind of accidentally. I got to know him, we became good friends and others. He wanted to bring in a coast to coast concert too. So the first thing was Lalguti J. Raman and Ramani. And uh, uh, 25 to 30 concerts were arranged and um, it was very successful. But in those days, things were very easy. You want to get a visa for these people? None of this rigmarole that you go through right now. You go to the federal building and you say that these are the artists I want to bring in. And they say, okay, good. These are the papers you need. Sign these papers. You sign. And then the visa is granted. It's a performance visa. It's a work permit. They send it by cable to the Madras embassy. Ask the people to come and pick up the visa and come. Life is very simple that way. But the hardest part is that once they come there, what do you do? How do you arrange the concerts for them in various cities? That is where the personal touch, the continuous conversation, dialogue that you've got in various cities that took place. VKV was, VKV Sunadan was indefatigable in that one. He didn't know anything about me. I was a graduate student in 69. I had come to the University of Pittsburgh. He Somehow came to know about me, calls me up and saying that I'm going to have Ramani Lalgudi Ramani's concert at the University of Pittsburgh. Can you please take care of such and such a thing, kind of your thing. One thing that really helps you a lot in all these matters is that you've got to be absolutely shameless in asking people for help. Okay, should not have any sense of shame at all on that. And should be willing to take no when they say no to you also. Both are there. And we give you some, some master in that. Okay. So, Arrange the program. The second program, he said that, okay, we'll bring Sheikh Chinna Maulana Sahib, Nadaswaram. Arrange for about 25, 30 concerts. TV Sankar Nair went on like that. So now things are going at an organic level, slowly growing. As more and more Indians are coming in, these, became, these programs became more and more viable. But the very interesting thing is that there was not a critical mass of Indians to support it. You bring in four people, you want to arrange 25 concerts in North America, and in Canada included actually, and then you find out that the amount of money you collect, how much will you get? For Dr. M. Balamurali Krishna, whom we brought in, who was at the pinnacle of his success at that time and other things, he came with Annavar Pramaswamy and uh, Mridangam was Tanjavur and there are four of them, they came, okay, we will get for the entire set in one town for one concert, maybe around $300. Because the admission ticket is $2 or $5, nothing more than that. Students are free. Okay? So you don't have that many people to support it. So you necessarily have to reach out <coughs> to the local population. The Americans over there, you have to interest them. Well, again, you don't have the social media or anything to advertise. So what we used to do is that write it by hand all the announcements and other things, <clears throat> you have to realize there are no Xerox machines in those days. Either you make multiple copies yourselves, or there was something called cyclostyled copies. I don't know how many of you heard that one. Okay, You have to cyclostyle that particular one. Okay, It's something like a drum kind of your thing. They will put it on your drum and rotate it, right? And then make copies or put ink on that one and rotate it and print it out. Then we go to the people where the hippies hang out. Okay, and uh, because these are the people who would be interested in Indian music and you go and hang out there. But then there was another major impediment and that is that by that time, if you ask them what is Indian music, Indian music means Hindustani music. Hindustani music means sitar music. Sitar music means Pandit Ravi Shankar, no one else. Nothing else was known at that time. So you got to involve the people who are outside of the Indian diaspora to understand that there's something called the Carnatic music and it is as ancient and as invigorating if you want to know if you hear it as Hindustani music that educational process has also to be done so we will have typically in your concert we are lucky if you get about 40 to 50 people now you look at 4820 people and you think that oh my god this is very easy no you used to get 40 to 50 people if you get that we declare victory and say that we got a successful program. Okay. Sometimes you'll get about 15, 20 people, 30 people. So we, we relied mostly on the local 
American population to come in and fill up the places and also get interested in our music, make them our loyal customers, so to say. So you will see that in a typical concert of a Ramani's concert, for example, or Lalgudi Jai Ramans or K.V. Narayanaswami, 50% of the population, sometimes 30% of the population will be Indians. The balance will be all Americans sitting down and listening to the music. Now it has changed. Now we don't even apply, advertise outside of the Indian community. I call it the curry circuit, okay? It's a curry circuit. You just go from town to town, there's an Indian organization, and the Indian organization has the, has the program, okay? So that's how we have come. But there's always you need an impetus to go from one level to the next level. What is the impetus? Sometimes it is something very benign, something that's very nice, something very exciting, but sometimes it is something very, very tragic, extremely tragic. So I wanted to look back into the United States in the 60s and 70s. The first thing that you get exhilarated about the United States, North America is that you have freedom. You have freedom to do whatever you want. As the nomads moved from the East African savannah to some unknown places, they were terrified of what else will be there, right? Similarly, the people who come into North America were terrified of only one thing, the unlimited freedom that the society gives it to you there. Why you are terrified of that one? Because that freedom allows you to pursue whatever you want to do to the best of your ability, to your maximum potential. You can do that and make a name for yourself. So that's why today you got in Google, you got a South Indian, Sundar Pichai. You go to Microsoft, you got... Yeah, another South Indian there. You take uh, McKinsey, the world's most respected consulting company, headed by an Indian. The largest airline in the United States was U.S. airline at a time, headed by an Indian. And you go in and say that these are the, and you go to any one of the Ivy League schools, Indians and Chinese will be there in good measure, representing the, 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 the total student population. So here is an opportunity for the people to do exceedingly well. But it's also very terrifying because you can also go through some other means. Okay? And you can ruin your life totally. And we came in at that time in the 60s and the early 70s as bachelors. Then we got married. Then we moved the family over there. Started uh, raising a family and other things. First three, four years all very good. There's a tremendous pressure for you to assimilate at that time. You have to assimilate, and then you look at assimilation comes with your cost. Okay, the benefit is that op opportunities open up, you can do anything you want, and the cost is that you can also go wrong. So, there are two cases one is two cousins, one was called Kumar, another was called Sudama. Family is extremely well known in uh, Tamil Nadu in Chennai. And uh, this is like a Keystone Cop movie. So they were all socialist, communist. They said the U.S. system is corrupt. We want to overthrow it violently. That's what they said. How do we do it? We need money for that. How do we get money? The best thing is that <clears throat> sell drugs, get money, usher in the revolution that the, the, uh, the country needs so desperately, the United States. That's what they thought. 21 years old, 19 year old, two boys from India. Okay, so uh, there was this guy, <coughs> Hadade, I think his name is, and he said that hey, that's a fantastic idea. I'll give you twelve thousand dollars, which is a lot of money in the 70s. Twelve thousand dollars. Go and get drugs from India. We'll sell it, make money, and then cause a revolution. This is where the movie business comes in. So the guy puts the money in cash on the trunk of the car, goes to the gas station, petrol station, pump petrol. Both of them wanted to go to the bathroom. The two guys, Kumar and Sudama, go there and somebody steals the car. They are frantic. After about an hour or so, they located the car, minus the money. Money was gone. The dad has said that, you give me money or I'll kill you. $12,000, you know, it's a lot of money. So Kumar decided that the best thing is that eliminate him. Can you imagine? Born and brought up in India, Sudama and Kumar. Take this guy to 
McKinney Park, Massachusetts. One guy held him. The other guy pulled the trigger and killed him. Pushed the body over into a ditch. The girlfriend was driving the getaway car. Went to the house, lied in the bed and kept saying, Kumar kept saying, I can't believe I killed a man. He kept saying that. Took the bus from all the way from Connecticut to go to San Francisco. The bus stopped in Cleveland, Ohio, where I was living. Unfortunately, police were waiting for them. Both were arrested. They were given 33 years in jail term without parole. Kumar came out of jail about three years ago, four years ago. Okay? There are only about 10 Indian families. Two of them in bad. And here, Indians are coming in droves. What is going to happen? What's going to happen to our children? And then the second thing happened, Subhu. Subhu Vedam. You can go and do a Google search on that. Subhu Vedam was arrested for murder. Drug deal went wrong. Penn State, College Station, less than 10 Indian families. So Bhu's father told us that my son is a bad guy, but he didn't commit murder. We were raising funds for him, for his defense. And the police guy said only one thing. Listen, we didn't care how you look. We didn't care what religion you belong to. We didn't care how you speak. We opened our society to you. We opened, we opened our home to you. And you come and sell drugs to our children? I'm going to use a very unparliamentary word. For him. He said that this son of a bitch, I know did not commit murder, but we are going to put him behind the bar so that he will never see a sunrise or a sunset for his rest of his life. So a completely white jury, completely prejudiced jury, I'm sorry, I'm being very racial on that, okay, convicted Subbu of a murder he didn't commit, put in the jail without parole, father died, he was not allowed to go for the funeral, mother Nalini died, was not allowed to go for the funeral, He's spending his time only in the jail from morning to night, all day. So, two families, in two different communities, less than 10 families in each one of the community, and then two or three kids go bad. Now thousands of Indians are coming in. Here is a society where anything is possible, and everything is possible. How do you take care of your children's life, their future? How do you shepherd them? So the first thing that happened was that there was a frantic activity of building temples all over. Today there are more than 500 temples in North America, functioning temples. If you take the temples that are somewhat legitimate in the sense that they have got, monetarily I'm talking about, not in any other sense, viable one, but if you take Overall, a structure that can be called a house of worship, there are more than 1,000 temples in North America. In those temples, we started bringing in musicians and dancers. So you are a kid. It doesn't matter. You have no option. There is Bala Vihar by Chinmaya Mission in every city. You got to go and attend Bala Vihar as a child. You go to the temple. You learn music or dance. Okay? And you, you are essentially given an opportunity to say that this is my heritage, this is my culture, this is what I belong to. I may live in the United States, I'm an American by birth, I'm an American in terms of overall my broad thinking and other things, but in the core of core, I'm still an Indian and I still value certain heritage, certain values and other things. And that is the second shock that came out to the North America based Indian saying that we got to do something about it. And hence, art is the one that took a broader leap also compared to various other activities. There are languageless classes taking place. I don't know how many of you know, in Bay Area alone, for Tamil, there are more than 1,000 children are learning this on Tamil. Mostly supported by Nagaratar. 
because nagaratar believe in the heritage and they not only believe they are willing to spend on top of it a lot of people who believe in that one but they stop with believing okay they will spend that money okay most of the temples are supported by them construction of the temples in north america telugu academy has got telugu classes in more than about 1000 to 1500 students are learning these are something that is currently taking place in north america because the people decided at that particular point saying that my heritage is very important my heritage is the one that is going to give a a steady a narrow and steady path to these children who are born and brought up in north america so that they don't go astray so today when you look at this video that you saw and you saw 4820 people i keep harping that number i don't want to say 5000 because for me this 4820 is burnt in my in my brain actually and he say oh it is easy no it was not easy he took somebody like vk vishwanathan for his foresight for his vision for his undefatigable energy to bring indian art over that and then he took a bunch of people people okay who said that our mission is not only to come here have a good earning provide for a good living for myself my family and my people back by in india but i also have to make sure that i secure the moral future of my own children our own children art played a very big important role in that and in that sense i want to show you one small clip of a video you cannot get any more traditional than you can stop it that i want to show you these small clips of video to say how traditional it can be you may not be able to even find such a thing sometimes even in mailapur or somewhere these are children born and brought up in north america okay they have got what is called ethnic pride right now and they say that i am proud of my heritage and they learned this and this is in the lobby of the of our auditorium where we have this procession we have this kolatam and more than about 100 children come and participate in that in our competition in our music competition dance competition sustaining sampradaya which is a teaching program we have got various group performance and other thing over 1500 children participate okay so in terms of the growth i, I will stop it in 5 minutes in case i am taking too much of time okay and um, in terms of the culture the music and art culture we bring in it is not as traditional that you would find in uh, in chennai or in any any one of the sabhas over here we do very innovative things but rooted in the most classical idiom totally totally very very authentic classical thing is what we try to give it. and um, whether it is whether it is a concert for example we tell them that this is the way we want to present it we do not want any of the lighter pieces for example it has got to be a heavy classical and so forth and if it is bharatanatyam or anything we commission original works saying that mahabharatam write the lyrics set the music and present it in five parts kind of and if it is nadaswaram most of the time in tamil nadu for example a nadaswaram player will be given anywhere between an hour and a half or two to play in cleveland they get five hours he said that six nadaswaram and six towels or four nadaswaram and four towels will come he got 130 to 630 okay five to five and a half hours play as if you will play in a temple kind of a thing okay and we take a margam for example in bharatanatyam usually bharatanatyam in chennai is about an hour and a half half the time actually it is also kind of interspersed with speeches explaining what they are going to do and other thing we give them a four hour slot saying that no announcement or anything like the olden days 
Kiriya dance. A single person has to dance as a margam, not as a group production or anything like that. So we, we go back to the roots, and the most classical roots, and try to give it. How do we make it happen? What is our focus? Our focus is children who are growing up in North America. Give them a point to move their, themselves, anchor themselves. The Cleveland Tyagaraja Festival is one such point for them, along with the temples and other things. That's the first focus. The second focus is that bring in some of the, the best performers, the most respected performers from India to come and perform. They could be popular, they may not be very popular. For example, we brought in somebody like T. Mukta, Kurikare Viswalingam, Manakal Rangarajan, Ye Sundaresan. These are not very, very popular artists, but they are deeply respected by the people by musicians and others, by other artists. We bring people like that, as well as all the popular artists. Sudhar Raghunathan, and you talk about Arunasai Ram, all those people also come and perform. Then we take a bunch of people who are mid-level, who are aspiring to go to the next level, and we give them an opportunity to come and perform. Then we take youngsters who are trying to break into it, into this art field, and we tell them that here's an opportunity, don't give up. Okay, there is a chance that you can you can also make it big. So bring in those youngsters. These are the kind of people we bring in for the programs over there. Most of the dance productions are commissioned productions. We give it to them, saying that here is a theme, here are the dancers, here is a choreographer, here is the musician who is going to write the lyrics, here is how the, the melody is going to be set, jadis have to be set, come and do the world premiere in Cleveland. That's what we do. So we push the envelope as far as music and dance are concerned, within the classical idiom. That's what we do. How do we make it happen? Who makes it happen? I am the public face of the Aradhana, but there are 500 other people minimum who come and work. They are C-level executives, like my good friend Rajan Nadrajan, for example, who kind of sicked me on to you, because otherwise you would not know. <laughs> I would not be here, okay? Rajar, you know, he is a very, very senior uh, executive. But he will take 10 days off. What does he do? He and his wife will be in the, in the kitchen, serving food. Not on the stage or anything like that. And there are people like that. And there are people who will come, take their time off, come over there. And they know exactly what they want to do, what they have to do. If they don't, they'll come and say, sir, is there anything I can do? I said, do this, this, this. I said, that's it. They come and do and go away. Nobody gets paid. Nobody gets paid. Okay. And... Uh, so the volunteer, so the group that we have got, is one of the biggest strengths that we have got. The next one is the artistic community. It's unbelievable the kind of support we get from the artistic community. I can name you a lot of people. These are the people who will come, for example. I want to give you one example. Call one guy, Sashi Kiran. He said, Sashi, come on home. We have to work on the schedule. He said, Mama, I met with an accident and uh, I am at home. I'm in terrible pain. I said, okay, I understand. Take a couple of uh, painkillers, pop it, come over right now. We have work to do. I said, okay. <laughs> Takes a couple of painkillers, comes over and works for about a couple of hours, okay? And you take somebody very senior, like either you're Santana Gopalan, for example, or you take Ravi Kiran or any of those people, okay? Nagai Murlidharan, Manar Gudi Yiswaran. I can keep on naming Trivarur, Vaidinathan, for example, VVS Murari, Ashok Ramani. These are the people who will drop everything they are doing and saying that we got to do the festival. We have to schedule it this way. The, and without your personal likes or dislikes, they will say that, this is the roster of artists you want to bring in. These are the people you want to this one, showcase and other things. And the work that was, the, the help that was given by Sri Mushnambi Raja Rao for you, can never forget for the first 20 years. Every concert, everything was meticulously planned by a human presenter. Okay? I can take Lal Gudi Jayaraman, Ram Badran, all these people are part of our DNA. So the artistic community is the biggest support. I'll tell you something. This will blow you away this particular one. The dancer Radha calls me one day and she says that in Tamil, yo, in the Russian, I am not going to do it. 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 She came home. She said, my life saving is 75 lakhs of rupees. 
take it as your loan. I can't afford to give it to you as a donation. Take it as a loan. I said, Radha, I cannot take it. She said, you have no option but to take it. Take the money because you need it. Now think back, take a step back. How many organizations will have somebody like an artist come and give that kind of money? Throughout the Vaidhinathan came to me and said, Anna, what are you doing? I'm going to go to the program. I'm going to go to the program. I'm going to go to the program. Now, bank will end up on a to which again. Why don't you take the money and then give it to me in September? Now, then I have IT. If I take the money and for some reason I'm not able to pay it back, what will you do with your daughter? As a couple of time, a Baha and Rikar, Panatha to Tungo. Okay, VBS Murari one day came. Mama, I want about uh, two minutes of your time. I said, I'm very busy. Tell me over the phone. Mama, I have to talk to you. I said, I'm very busy. I said, I am at your doorstep. What, why don't you open the door? Say, go there over. What is it you want? I was kind of testing. Gives me $8,000. I know you need the money. Please take it. I said, Murari, two years ago, you lost your house because of the flood. Your father was evacuated by the Coast Guard. Okay? You have taken a 45 lakhs of rupees of loan from the bank to construct your house. And you, you got two daughters to be educated and married. How can I take the money? Same thing. You have no option, Mama. Take this money. Whenever you can, you give it back to me. I gave the money and walked away. Look at it. I'm saying that how many organizations in India or in the world will have an artist come and tell you, take my life savings? That's our biggest strength. Every one of them in their own way. Every one of them in their own way. Whether it is Santana Gopalan or Ashok Ramani or Nagai Murali Dharan or any one of them, Manargudi Iswaran, in their own way, whether it is through money or physical effort, They say it is our festival and we have to work with you. We have to make it successful. In that sense, if I have to take a step back, they'll say I'll take a step back. Next comes the patrons who support it. There are people who will come unannounced saying that, sir, I heard about yours. We would like to support your festival. And there are quite a few like that. There's a person in West Coast. He called me up one day. I never met him. I said, I want to come to the festival. I will only, I will take 13 days off. He is an entrepreneur. He runs his own company. He is very, very, okay, this one, what do you call our next post? This uh, diplomat's courier box, they call it. I want them to come next week. I said, what do I do? Well, you have to send it by cable, he said. And that will cost you $7.50. And I was looking around for $7.50 and I had and I gave it to him. He said, okay, by cable it went. That was life like that. At that time, very easy. Not, nowadays, it's more difficult. But, but we have a track record. For example, we put in about 120 to 130 people on our visa list. And um, we haven't had any rejection. Okay? There was one rejection in 2019 for a towel player because he was very young and he had no known income substantial income that you could show you to the embassy and they said that I'm not giving you the visa go back and come with more experience this is exactly what he said and show you a better financial condition I will be the first person to give you the visa is what they said so we have an excellent relationship with the American embassy here absolutely here as well as in state department over there and homeland security it's not a major problem for us to get the visas They used to be very interested, as I said, now because of the large number of Indian populations and others, it has become more of a curry circuit, catering to only to the local Indians over there. But we do try to have outreach program with uh, local Americans. We have jazz and other fusion programs. We involve the Cleveland State University's orchestra to work with us and other things. So we, we, we take the Cleveland... Uh, Um, you know, university, state university as well as the general orchestra also get them involved. We go out to the other university, reach out to the American professors, music professors and others, ask them to collaborate. Wesleyan University, for example, brings in their quote-unquote American students to come and perform last year. They, this year they performed in Cleveland. We do that. But by and large, the kind of engagement we had in the 70s and 80s has come down now because of the large percentage of Indian population that have moved in and They are self-sustaining, so, so it becomes more inward-looking than outward. Why one of the greatest singers hmm. one of the greatest 
Who is that person? Who say it again? I didn't get it. Greatest? Oh, why, why did he stand outside? Oh, private. It was a very private function, wedding. It was a wedding. He was not invited, so he said that. But they were very much interested in hearing the music, so they would rather stand outside and listen, and not than not and then miss it. They didn't want to miss the concert, and that used to happen all the time in Chennai. In in wedding concerts and other things, there will be people standing outside just listening to that one because they are kind of shy not to go in because they were not invited. Young person asking. <laughs> right, yeah. But one of the greatest things that has happened, I must add, is this. Today it has opened up avenues of uh, financial security for a lot of Indian musicians and dancers. I want to give one final example before, because I don't want to stand in the way of the next talk, actually. Is that today, the question was asked, how many people are deeply interested in classical Carnatic music in Greater Chennai? From Kumudi Poundi to Gobichetti, this one what they call uh, Gurumanjeri, if you take, there may be about 5,000 to 6,000 people who are deeply interested in classical, Indian classical music. Out of that, about 500 people will be willing to pay for a concert. The rest of them are always looking for all are welcome kind of a thing. Okay? As a percentage of the Indian diaspora, if you take, in United States and Canada, I would say that about 20 to 25,000 people are interested in Carnatic music and Bharatanatyam, maybe even 30,000. I'll give you one number. In Toronto, for example, there is a Tamil Mandram who runs, who does a certification program in Carnatic music, seven levels. 3,000 kids write that exam. 3,000 people write that exam in Toronto city alone. The Tamil Mandram. Okay, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenally successful one. They give the syllabus, you learn from your local teacher, Come back and uh, write the exam, and you get graded. Okay. How many people pass? How? How many people pass? pass? About uh, seventy to eighty percent will pass. Okay. So you take uh, that's in one city. So there are about fifty thousand, sixty thousand people. These people are willing to learn from senior artists, from or well-known artists, or or somebody with vidwat from India, and they are willing to pay in U.S. dollars. So if you get paid about forty, fifty dollars an hour, and you take about 10 students actually you mean the on the Skype and video and other thing and you take about four classes a month you make about anywhere between thousand to two thousand dollars a month you don't have to worry about what the sabas pay you okay you still need to perform in the sabas because that's the one that gives you legitimacy in the eyes of all the people you got to be featured in as many concerts as possible but you are not beholden to the money that you get out of that particular one the North American market is so important today for the for the people okay it's really unbelievable and it gives them for most of them it gives them a very very good livelihood and i will again say that the festival the cleveland Tiagaraja festival and various other festivals that happens throughout north america are the ones that have enabled this particular phenomenon Sir, do you get the drama troops also from here <clears throat> not as much as music and dance because it's Strictly, most of the orientation is towards very, very classical music and dance. Okay, and um, they talk about there is a very interesting thing that has happened. <coughs> there is only two system of art that flourishes in North America. Okay, if you take Bharat dance, you can be a Gujarati, you can be a Marathi, you can be Punjabi. It doesn't matter, Tamil or anybody. There is either Bharatanatyam or Bollywood dancing. These are the only two. Seriously, there is no Kathak, there is no Mohini Atam, there is not that much of your Kuchipudi or anything. They are there in small pockets. But any city you go, there will be three or four Bharatanatyam dance teachers. All of them will have 200 to 300 students. Okay? Similarly, more than Hindustani music, Carnatic music is far more um, supportable, financially supportable in North America today. So these two. And, and the primary reason is the enormous number of the local teachers who encourage these students to enroll, teach them, and prepare them for the next level and so forth. Okay. And that, their, their contribution has got to be appreciated, the local teachers over there.
Thank you very much. It is a pleasure meeting all of you and talking to you.